Judas Priest is one of the first terms that comes to my mind whenever anybody mentions the word heavy metal. They are synonymous with the genre, and they are one of the godfathers of heavy metal, and they are one of the icons, one of the, one of the bands on this plateau of a god, pretty much. They are part of the first wave of British heavy metal along with Sabbath, and they are always in the debate of who was the real first heavy metal band. The interesting thing about Judas Priest is they didn't really start out as a heavy metal act. In fact, they started out as more of a prog rock act. Especially in the early days, their music was not, when you listen to it now, it doesn't sound very metal. It sounds more proggy, more like something like Rush, at times something like Pink Floyd. And one of the coolest things about Judas Priest, one of my favorite things about this band is if somebody ever came up to me and, and said, give me an example of rock slash heavy metal from 1974 to 2008. I want an example of how metal evolved through the years. I would say listen to Judas Priest's discography because they are one of the only bands that has adapted to each era successfully. They have actually been able to do it and they weren't frowned upon. Most of the time when bands do this they are frowned upon. It's like, well, they're just doing what was in style at the time, but many times they created that style. And some occasions they didn't, they just adapted, but they always adapt really well because the music itself is so good. That is one of the favorite thing, my favorite things about this band. Only a few bands in history have been able to do that. The only one I can think of at this moment is the Beatles. And Judas Priest is definitely on the same level as the Beatles. They're one of the biggest bands one of the most iconic bands in history. And when most people mention this band, they think of big albums throughout their career. They have a huge discography at this point, but they think of really big albums at this, career, uh, at this point in their career. British Steel, Painkiller, Screaming for Vengeance, Sad Wings of Destiny, but you hardly ever hear people talk about their debut album, Rockerola. And the reason why is because it actually is, it's not that it's not good or not strong, it's more of it doesn't really sound like Priest yet. They didn't find themselves, in my opinion, until their next album, Sad Wings, which is a masterpiece. It, it really just doesn't sound like Priest yet. They didn't use Rob Halford's amazing voice yet. They didn't use, you didn't hear the amazing twin leads of, of K.K. Downing and Glenn Tipton yet. You didn't hear the signature sounds that you would hear from Judas Priest for the next 30, 40 years. It, it, really, it, they, it really is a premature debut album, you know, and not all bands hit it out of the park with their debut album like Iron Maiden or Metallica, and, and Judas Priest didn't. So Judas Priest formed around 1969, and this was before Rob Halford even came to the band. Like I said, he was he was new by the time they came out with their debut album. Uh, the original singer was named Al Hack Atkins, Al Hackins, Al Atkins. Kind of a weird name. Anyways, and you know they toured throughout the early 70s. They were really kind of a small band at this at this point because there was some huge bands in the early 70s, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Pink Floyd. They were they really didn't find their sound until the late 70s. So they finally got a record deal and started working on their first album, and that's when they kind of got Rob, Rob Halford. A lot of the material actually on this album was written before he even came into the band. And that might be another reason why it doesn't sound like Signature Priest, because Rob Halford has a lot to do with the writing of, of Judas Priest. Uh, I really like the rock and roll vibe, you know, kind of a kind of Coca-Cola, basically. The front album, the original, is really cool. It's the bottle cap that says rock and roll -a. They later changed it to a different piece of art around 1987, I believe. There's rumors as to why they did this. Uh, some people say that the Coke company actually pressured them because... It looked fuck get the fuck out of here, fly. The Coke company actually pressured them because it looked so much like the Coca-Cola logo 
that it wasn't a smart idea to have it on an album cover, but the band refers it as the real album cover. They show it when they go tour. So I really like the artwork. I like the vibe. Uh, but the actual music, let's talk about Now, the band claims that they played the entire thing live, on the floor, as a band, live, just recorded. That is what the band claims. I'm not sure. Sometimes it sounds like there's overdubs. And sometimes it doesn't. It does sound very raw, I'll admit. First song is called One for the Road. And right when it starts playing, you're like, whoa, this definitely sounds like it's from the 70s. It sounds very progressive. Yeah, the studio production is not that great. Um, the riff itself is not that great. And the, the main problem that I have with this entire album is how repetitive it is. You know, it's, it's, it's so weird to say this, right, in, in these days that Judas Priest actually at one point in their career were not really great music writers. You know, for me, Rockarola is growing pains for this band. I mean, they're an amazing band. They made a lot of really good albums, but it just feels like they were growing on this album. So One for the Road is okay, but it's just too repetitive for me. It just repeats, like literally. I'm not even talking about choruses this time. I'm talking about the music kind of just, it loops. Next song is the title track, Rockarola. And right off the bat, this, al this uh, album, this song has a, a, a weird uh, riff. Sounds very uh, uh, 70s, I guess is a, a term. Um, really, uh, I don't know. It just, it's just not a good riff. It doesn't sound like Priest. It is annoyingly catchy. Like this riff has been in my head for the last couple of days. I can't get it on my head. The song itself is nah, not that great. The next three songs, um, Winter Deep Freeze and Winter's Retreat was originally made as a three-piece suite, the Winter Suite. But their producer decided to cut all three parts up, making them different tracks. It still sounds like it's kind of one song. Winter is the intro, uh, and it's okay. It doesn't pick up until later. It sounds very 70s you know. Uh, next song is Deep Freeze. And it starts out with a pretty good drum solo, and it kind of carries on the same idea as Winter. And the last part is Winter's Retreat. And the whole first half, maybe even more, of this is just guitar effects, and it doesn't even sound good. And, you know, like, Judas Priest, as I keep saying, they will go on to become an amazing, amazing band, both uh, performance-wise and sonically in the studio, but it just didn't happen. The guitar effects in this part of the of the album, not good. The second half is slow and, and, and kind of dark. There's a lot of elements on this album that actually sounds like something like Pink Floyd. Not as good though, because the production um, on this album is not nearly as good as, as the stuff that Pink Floyd was doing. But overall, that whole suite is, it's okay. The next song is called Cheater, and this is one of the moments on the album where it actually sounds something reminiscent of a Judas Priest song. Very catchy riff. It actually, you're like, okay, this sounds kind of like Priest. Uh, so, pretty damn good song. The next song is called Never Satisfied, and like Cheater, it actually kind of sounds like Priest, but for the most part, it's just kind of boring. Next song is called Run of the Mill, and for me, this is the highlight on the entire album. It's long. Starts out slow, very progressive. Once again, sounds something kind of like Pink Floyd, but it actually works. It's it's one of the more enjoyable moments on the album. It sounds a little bit more like they what they would do next. Next song is called "Dying to Meet You," and this is just another kind of weird track for me. The last song is called "Caviar of the Mets," and originally this song was a really long epic, something like 14, 15 minutes long, um, and the main writer on it was Al Atkins, the original singer. But they stripped it down to about two minutes, and it's, it's okay. <laughs> it's nothing great. It's no highlight, that's for sure. Now before you guys see this review, you know, this is going to be my first review of, Ju of a Judas Priest album. And you aren't going to know what I think until the next review. Before you guys, you know, look at my score and look at what I say about this album, realize that I'm talking about one album and I'm not talking about the entire band. 
Like I've been saying, this album started, this band kind of started off on a rocky foot, but eventually they would pick it up. Within the next couple of years, they were already starting to write a lot of stuff that was going to be on Sad Wings at this point. So I'm going to give Rock and Roll by Judas Priest a 5 out of 10. Later, guys.